Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rob Saval. I am the provost here at MICA. It is my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this morning's uh, event, which uh, we are calling uh, MICA Talks. And um, MICA Talks is an opportunity to celebrate some of the amazing work that uh, comes out of our alumni community. And I think what you'll see and hear through these alumni talks is really um, how MICA as an educational institution, how MICA as a community of artists and scholars um, helps provide the kind of transformative experience that launches people into amazing um, careers and pathways that make a real difference in the world. And so um, I think we have a really exciting program this morning, and I uh, so appreciate all of you being here and um, and being part of this uh, this morning's event. But I'd also like to mention that we have a whole day filled with activities um, during the second day of Michael Weekend, and uh, I know that um, that it's wet and a little cool, and that the wind is blowing a bit. But our activities are principally indoors, and so all you have to do is make it from one building to the next. Uh, and you'll find a number of wonderful opportunities uh, to really get a better sense of what happens at MICA in the classroom and with our various programs. Um, so this afternoon, um, I invite you to go to the open studios uh, in some of the classroom buildings and some of the fabrication laboratories and to really see um, what happens uh, at MICA in art and design education in uh, kind of contemporary studio practices. Um, having said that, um, it's my pleasure to now introduce a couple of the, um, or to say, uh, to welcome a couple of our uh, members of the Board of Trustees who are with us today. Sheila Murphy is here, and Stuart Cooper is here. And Stuart is not only a member of the Board of Trustees, but is also an alum of MICA. And Stuart is going to be introducing our speakers. So Stuart, can you introduce yourself, please, and introduce our speakers? Thank you so much. Go, I mean, go into my bed, hate speaking in front of you. I hide behind walls. Um, I'm here to introduce you to Bora Shin, who is a Catalan and works at Samsung and is one of uh, really one of the great people in design for them and one of the great people in the country. Um, I can, there's not a lot of us here, so I, instead of going into a lot of detail, and she's right here, I'm going to let her tell you about who she is and what she does. Cool. By next year, it will be like 20 years since I um, graduated from MICA and uh, thought about what can I share today. Um, um, and you know, as, as, as much as how I evolved as a designer, I started off as a graphic designer um, to what I'm doing now. I mean, the design industry also evolved uh, significantly and it's been very true transformative, which I thought uh, I can share that journey with you um, and walk you through how um, design industry has become such an um, emerging and um, exciting place to uh, be part of um, more than ever before. Um, so <clears throat> uh, gradu upon graduation as, uh, uh, from graphic design department, um, I started my career um, right here in Baltimore, East, um, East Baltimore, um, at a studio called Rokka Wira Design. Um, I believe Tony Rokka might be still teaching at graphic design department, but um, I started off as a print graphic designer. 
um, and really explored uh, typography and um, book as a three-dimensional form and explore how type and form and um, sort of institutional like uh, identity system as well as the um, the narrative of how school education could sort of shape um, students' life uh, was sort of my um, main um, you know practice uh, at um, Rucker React Design. Um, as you can see, I don't know if you do recognize, but some of these um, catalogs that I designed with Tony are for MICA um, back in the year 2000. I don't know, six? Eight. Yeah, 2008, <laughs> 2006, um, along with other um, local to national uh, educational institutions that, um, um, that we were able to sort of um, craft a very beautiful um, um, uh, communication materials. Um, and I would say that uh, my, my First step into the career in the design field, um, I, I've learned a lot, um, craft and um, attention to details and utilizing typography and you know, um, forming a very interesting and intriguing uh, storyline in, in, a, in a form of a book. Um, I also wondered um, how I can broaden my um, design practice um, beyond as a graphic designer and that's um, what had led me to um, uh, pursue my MFA at Art Center. Um, I, uh, I was in a program called Media Design Practices, which is sort of taking the visual communication and then kind of allowing you to explore in uh, through technology or spatial context to um, different type of design, um, d design research disciplines. Um, and even then, I think, and as you would be able to see throughout my talk and also some of the work that I share with you, um, uh, that sort of core identity as a designer, as a visual communication sort of um, carried on and it, is, it has become sort of the uh, you know, central part of who I am as a visual designer. So at Art Center, um, what sort of ended uh, after going through many different explorations, um, at the end of, uh, through my thesis work, I, I was very much intrigued by um, um, how, how our uh, Earth is sort of imaged by the satellites and um, in a way how some of these technology um, glitches, if you will, um, seem very poetic and uh, um, compelling to me. <laughs> Um, at the same time, there was uh, sort of a question about our relationship with technology and what, and our rights as um, as people that are sort of impacted and sort of um, uh, influenced by these technologies. So, as my thesis, I just sort of, I, I've, I've kind of. Um, uh, in the interest of intersection of uh, visual communications to technology and also um, participatory design, I've, um, uh, my thesis ended up being uh, that it, designing of uh, activity for uh, people to uh, fill the pixels um, in the size of a satellite um, to, uh, for an attempt to get captured uh, as the commercial satellite sort of rotates around the world. Um, and, or around the globe, and uh, by giving them the tools and educations of when that satellite will be in the geographic location that you are, um, will be sort of the process of learning about technology that is sort of uh, immersed and is part of every day that it's very unfamiliar and invisible to us. So uh, that work, interestingly, sort of led me to Jet Propulsion Laboratory at NASA. Um, so there's a cool um, group of uh, designers and artists that, who is part of a job proposal laboratory and um, what they do is they do a lot of um, installations and uh, exhibitions to um, uh, in, in the effort of um, public outreach of all, all of the different type of uh, research and missions that um, um, JPL does and it was it was the year 2000, 2012, 
Uh, it was most, one of the most exciting time for JPL because um, that was the year also when um, Curiosity was landing, parachuted to the Mars. Um, so there was a lot of excitement and uh, during that um, uh, live streaming of the mission control room, which you see at the top left, um, you see it, it sort of broke the perception of how what you would think of a, a um, uh, you know, the 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 NASA engineers or NASA scientists with you know very young some women a lot of females and then also those that with like mohawk and um, so it, it sort of um, broke the perception or the existing notion of how you would perceive as like the uh, NASA scientists so that was really awesome but my, what I did was that taking my thesis work to um, again continuing on the participatory. Uh, research as sort of a baseline to kind of come up with a um, public outreach uh, um, event for high school students. Um, um, it was uh, year 2013 was the year when there's next um, mission uh, for June, or next mission to Jupiter was um, on, will be launching to go to, um, uh, launching to go to Uh, the Juno mission, which is a mission to um, uh, observe the Jupiter uh, as a planet, space. and um, I was given the opportunity to uh, propose various different um, public outreach uh, exercises and uh, activities that the uh, nationwide uh, high school students would be able to do during the time when Juno sort of fly by. Uh, Earth um, on its way to gain momentum to get to uh, Juno. So, um, taking my thesis to uh, think about like put together a um, very large, uh, you know, puzzle uh, that is a form of a um, Juno was sort of uh, one of the one of the uh, proposal I had put together for the public outreach program, uh, along with um, how to help students imagine the aurora of the, of the, uh, of the Jupiter, as well as um, uh, idea of the time capsule, since uh, you know, Juno, uh, Jupiter is one of the uh, longest um, and the first um, uh, planet in our Earth that um, holds um, most origin of the particles that uh, reveals about the entire uh, solar system. So um, this, this was, this was very uh, exciting and unexpected opportunity that sort of landed for me as a designer um, and really helped me think about how design can sort of uh, be in places at uh, where you you could have ever or I could have ever imagined like when I was grad graduating from MICA uh, back in 2004. So it was very exciting. Um, at the same time, um, I was also interested in um, how design can impact uh, beyond as a form maker. Um, and uh, upon, graduation, uh, upon graduation of my master's, um, I paired with another alum uh, named Matthew Manus. And um, this idea about designing uh, a business as a form of design, um, meaning um, we wanted to sort of test the social, uh, social enterprise model um, when, uh, with, with the idea of um, do, doing good by doing well. Um, meaning, if we were to uh, you know design a design uh, design a um, business um, that is uh, committed to giving half of its work to a nonprofit organization, will we still be able to thrive as a social enterprise or small business? Uh, at the same time, sort of contributing back to the community was sort of the premise. So we started off with two of us, and um, half of the work that we say we are giving as a pro bono services, um, we. Um, we mobilized about 450 number of volunteers who wanted to commit to this mission. Um, but by doing so, it, it also opened up some opportunities for some of those that who wants to kind of get into uh, design field or how they're pursuing the, the, the more purpose-driven um, way of applying their design practices into a tangible way. Um, and 
we grew quite quickly uh, from two to um, 12 uh, individuals uh, across you know, New York, LA, and Austin, Texas. And on the third year, I um, partnered with um, social uh, design department here at MICA. And um, uh, we were able to, so you see Heejin and Jessica Wen, um, and also Katrina was the third uh, designer that uh, are mix of graduates from the social design department as well as graphic design department here uh, were, uh, um, uh, were brought up, brought on as a part of a design fellow. Um, and um, Katrina was deployed to Uganda uh, with, in partnership with UNICEF uh, innovation team and was able to conduct a lot of the field research on ground uh, to learn more about um, how basic um, mobile phone could be used um, as a way to uh, polling different type of surveys and learn about different communities, what their needs are. So U-Report was uh, a already piloted um, small product um, that uh, one of the country office originated from the UNICEF um, Uganda country office, but then with, with the resource and um, um, push of sort of uh, uh, technology use of technology uh, by the UNICEF innovation team, um, it was at a place where it wanted to scale to all other country offices. So, um, with you know. All three of our uh, MICA graduates, um, we were able to um, come up with a, a branding that could be globalized, but at the same time that has a unity and coherence to be able to sort of reflect and um, represent the global community of the youth that are participating in this sort of uh, um, voicing uh, what they what they care for in their community and what they um, what they would like to see change. So. It's definitely exciting because um, it launched uh, the branding as well as the uh, digital um, uh, digital uh, web product was launched at year 2004, uh, year 2008 <laughs> um, when uh, it, and it was introduced during the UNGA, which was quite huge. Um, and it was also around time when the Ebola breakout happened. So um, by deploying this to uh, Sierra Leone, um, they were able to quickly get um, what are sort of the conditions um, that youth are in impacted by the Ebola, such as not able to you know, go to school and that, that they care about the education, but, um, um, and how UNICEF um, country offices along with the local partners will be able to make that sort of intervention. So it was quite, quite um, uh, meaningful in that sense and that um, and the you know the brand continues to live and it's it's sort of uh, scaled tremendously than what you see here today <laughs> um, so um, I thank you to uh, uh, you know social design department that who sort of um, partic partook on the mission with us and uh, sending you know, recommending amazing students um, or graduates to, um, you know, uh, explore this sort of uh, mission-oriented uh, volunteerism and fellowship program that we were, um, um, we were initiating uh, at Very Nice. Um, and by working with uh, many different type of nonprofit organization from both um, global to, you know, local, um, they, I felt that there was still sort of a limitation in terms of how a, um, you know, um, how a, uh, you know, the, the entity that sort of um, comes in as a catalyst for change or catalyst for support, um, it's very limited in the way that what the organ true organizational um, uh, challenges look like. So that sort of led me to as a, um, at the LA Mayor's Office, uh, which was funded by the Bloomberg Philanthropies, and at that time, um, and even so now, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies are sort of, sort of a champion of um, resourcing a lot of the local governments uh, with new skill sets, uh, such as data science, um, project management, and design. And I led that effort at the Mayor's, uh, mayor's Office. And a lot of my work at that time um, 
besides the, uh, what you see in the middle, which is a citywide campaign, um, so a lot of that visual communication graphic design this uh, still comes through, but a lot of my world during uh, my mayor's office, the tenure at my mayor's office, uh, involved more of what you see on the left and the right, where doing a lot of the community um, uh, you know, workshops, um, and as a way to inform and um, educate the mayoral staffs and um, commu uh, the, the city department leaders to think about their residents and the community from a user center point of view. And by going there to talk to them, um, how to facilitate a very structured um, workshop that kind of mature, could, could materialize into a set of um, action uh, action items that can actually influence the some of the services that the city can deploy to uh, support our city residents. So there were two um, primary um, initiatives that I was part of. One was to one was to help the help support the uh, low, low income residents at um, uh, are vulnerable to evictions during the housing crisis at uh, Los Angeles. So um, uh, through a lot of community um, engagement and learning about what their barriers are in terms of um, not knowing what their rights are to be protected of their homes that they are living in um, uh, was sort of resulted out of the um, citywide campaign um, of um, how they can be protected. Um, in, a, in addition to um, we uh, the the previous uh, model of the using text message as a way to um, survey uh, that that method sort of carried over here as well where um, it, 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 it we opened up the database of the city um, rent control units where you uh, the residents could just quickly uh, enter in their uh, rental unit address and then they'll be able to tell like whether their unit is covered by the rent, rent, rent control and that it, it, it directly sort of um, connects them over to some of the um, housing rights that they ha have. Um, so um, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was a, a huge learning experience for me um, uh, to, you know, engage with the community and how uh, delivering uh, a service for end user uh, in the context of uh, politics and you know policymakers and uh, very complex um, you know city ordinance to deliver something that's very tangible and meaningful and impactful was um, was a huge learning uh, for me at the time. And then uh, the next initiative was to was about. Um, helping the LAPD recruit and hire more um, ideal um, police, uh, po police officers. And we gone through about six months of just defining the definition of what ideal meant uh, from different parts of the communities to partner, the community partners and so on. Um, and you can see at the top right of spectrum of what are some of the characteristics of a, a police officer that are deal breaker to uh, non-deal uh, non breakers to, you know, understanding what the challenges are from different parts of the uh, city of Los Angeles. Um, and we sort of came up with a set of about 12 different services that we could um, drive change in the pipeline of recruiting and hiring of uh, LAPD um, officers uh, was another initiative that um, I was uh, fortunate enough to be part of, and again, I think a lot of the work here um, from evolving from, you know, visual designer to, um, you know, doing more of a, a community engagement to extract what are some of the needs that uh, end user will may um, want and, um, uh, you know, want and sort of extracting that to a more tangible um, delivery of a service uh, sort of uh, was the main um, role at the LA Mayor's innovation team. Um, at the same time, I think uh, I, you know, I I was uh, able to go back to the classroom and teaching the uh, course called Transmedia at an undergraduate graphic design department. I currently also teach as well. And um, as much as the industry had changed as a graphic as a designer. Um, 
the classroom also changed uh, significantly as well where you know there's um, bridging of the visual communication to um, use of technology um, and uh, some of the projects that um, between you know Brad Barlett and uh, Miles and myself uh, the, the courses that we taught were um, stem from the graphic design foundations of you know developing identity system of a certain brand and then um, thinking about from a print matters to then um, scaling to you know um, digital services of mobile web and then kind of thinking about um, allowing that uh, visual identity system to be uh, Ex, uh, you know, experience in the spatial media. Um, so these are some of the um, work that came out of those class, and it was. Uh, it, it, I, I, I'm still always in awe of how how talented the um, design students could be um, in in their uh, in in as, as undergraduates and um, and how much our graphic design. Um, as a practice has sort of evolved over the years. Um, and it's always an inspiration for me to be in the classroom. And last but not least, um, that sort of as a graphic designer to now um, uh, the role that I'm serving at Samsung, I'm part of an um, organization called uh, Service Business Organization. So as you may know, Samsung is really well known as a hardware company. Um, but uh, in the past several years, um, uh, the company has been investing a lot more into the service experiences, meaning um, how we deliver certain service into for, for um, TV devices as well as mobile devices. So um, I don't know how many of you, I, I think this is Micah, so I, I don't know how many of you are Samsung users as opposed to iPhone users. <laughs> but you know some of the um, uh, services that uh, you'll see in your device, um, I'll show you today, uh, which is what my team had led. Um, even my career at a consumer um, you know, device uh, industry, I started off as a visual interaction design um, manager uh, and then sort of evolved into a now a um, head of UX leading both the uh, TV UX team as well as the mobile UX team along with the research team. And our team focuses on delivering um, or imagining the future of how, what gaming and media and art and lifestyle uh, services may look like and how we deliver to the device of TV and mobile. Um, and our group uh, does an end-to-end, -end, so we sort of do competitive uh, you know, market research and then think about what are the great opportunities there will be for as a Samsung. Um, and then think about how we deliver those services in the near future, which is like two, three years out. And sometimes a very fast-paced organizations, like you would um, concept to, I, I've been there almost four years and I already launched four products. <laughs> so you could see how fast the company has, um, company runs. But I thought I'll end with some of the services that our team had delivered in the past four years uh, from gaming media art and to uh, lifestyle. Um, thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Bora. That was so interesting and exciting, and I can see why. And by the way, I know when, when uh, Stuart Cooper, who's my fellow board trustee, <laughs> said to me, I don't like public speaking, I thought he was pulling my leg, because he pulls my leg all the time. Uh, and here he was behaving so well-mannered that I almost didn't recognize Stuart. Good morning, everybody. We're, I'm delighted and honored to welcome you. Let's give each of you a huge big round of applause for braving the weather and being here. Thank you so much. And thank you to, to Rob, who sort of said, hey, guys, you know, when he used the, tr uh, the term, um, um, uh, what was the term that you use about launching off um, transformative experiences, which I thought was such a powerful term for each of you. So whether you're students or whether you're um, parents who are here, and thank you for traveling from all across the US and all across the globe to be here to support your children, who as they become rock stars in their own right as greatest artists, like you can see Bora Shin, who by the way, flew down from LA just to be here for today's talk. So I think let's give her another round of applause. Thank you, Bora. And who would have thought, I thought when I was going to introduce Alexandra, I was going to talk about the space connection, but here we have a space connection with you as well, talking about your NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratories, JPL. What a great, great story, and it's so exciting, and I'm sure Micah is proud of you, your family is proud of you, and every parent here is thinking, if only my child could do that and then some more and help, you know, JPL and NASA, then I'll never care that they did art because all of us think, ooh, art. But you can do cool things like art and still influence some of the top engineers in the world and you don't even have to study aerospace engineering to have a huge impact. So uh, the next uh, incredible alumni speaker, oh, and talking about introductions, I know Rob said, Stuart, we each had to introduce ourselves, but Stuart being so shy did not introduce himself. So I don't have any remarks for Stuart other than he pulls my leg re regularly. His wife is brilliant, like most women, right? Uh, he is a MICA alum in film, in uh, f uh, photography, uh, and like my husband, by the way, I'm a, uh, the, the wife of a MICA faculty member who started a graduate program here at MICA, very proud spouse of a MICA member. And Stuart will not share this with you, but he's one of the most generous donors to MICA because he believes in MICA, he believes in the education that this incredible institution gave him. Uh, he is a producer or the producer of America's Most want Wanted and God knows how many other shows. So whatever millions he's given, it's nothing compared to what he can give and will give because he is so appreciative of the incredible benefit and impact that Micah has had on his life and his career. So let's give a round of applause to our <laughs> incredible alumni. Thank you, Stuart. So when Rob said briefly introduce yourself, I, as I said, my claim to fame is being the spouse of a, of a MICA faculty member, but also in my own right, he helped me. And so when Bora was talking about giving away stuff for free, our website, muthi.com, which is the world's most popular legal website, was because we gave away everything for free. We gave away, gave away free education to educate the world on rules and policies and laws dealing with U.S. immigration. So a lot of MICA students and students from all over the country and all over the world who want to understand the law, especially 30 years ago, would have to pay a lawyer a lot of money, but now everything was free on our website, murti.com. So we edu believe in education and empowerment, enlightenment of people so that they can go and learn a lot of stuff rather than feeling like in the dark. When I went through my immigration, my lawyer never contacted me, never got in touch with me, and he inspired me. Thanks, to what, whenever life gives us lemons, turn them into lemonade. That's my philosophy, and so he had motivated me to do my immigration law firm, which is for anybody who ever needs it. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here to introduce our next brilliant, amazing, talented MICA graduate. Uh, we're going to go next with um, Winston Frazier, right? And Winston is graduated from MICA in 2016 with a BFA in painting. Oh, did you want me to switch to Alexandra? I know he asked me not to. Are you ready now? Ready, so you oh, okay. 
okay, great. They, they had just told me that she was in the wrong building to switch. So uh, we can, we, we're brilliant. We can do anything on a, a, a turn on a dime. But okay, Alexandra, I'll have the pleasure of briefly introducing you, right? So thank you so much for being here. And in spite of getting lost, being ready to go gung-ho as the next speaker. So I was even asking your pronunciation. It's Alexandra Bogonovic. Oh, perfect. Okay. So she's a MICA alum who received a BFA degree in fiber in 2012, so fairly recent, received a Master of Professional Studies in Business of Art and Design degree the following year, also from MICA. So if you're not happy with your kid doing one degree in MICA, make them do at least two degrees so they can become successful like Alexandra, right? Um, she's the CEO. Um, She's now a CEO of her company. She leads a woman-owned small business in College Park, Maryland, just down the road in the DC suburbs, that specializes in the design, fabrication, and installation of multi-layer insulation blankets that protect spacecraft hardware from the harsh environments of space. We seem to be having a trend here with MICA and space, right? It's incredible. Her team is made up of makers, artists, engineers, most of whom have a background in textiles, fiber, fashion, or costume design. Beautiful, beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Alexandra. Alexandra. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Um, my name is Alexandra Bogunovich. I go by Alex. I'm the owner and founder of AeroThreads. Um, and we are outside of College Park, now in Riverdale. We recently relocated. Um, just to kind of give you a story of the last 20 years of my life, how I got from applying to art schools to running an aerospace company, I'll start at the beginning. And um, really what drives me as a person um, so, as you can see, a lot of these pictures in here are family. I have a huge, very supportive um, immigrant family from Serbia. Um, I'm first generation. My parents immigrated. I have a lot of very, um, very accomplished and loving siblings that pu they push us very hard. All three of us, um, very family oriented. I love my hobbies right now. Are I love biking, cooking, and traveling. I'm from the Midwest. I relocated out to the East Coast, actually, when I moved out here to go to Micah, and then I never went back other than visiting. Um, and most importantly to this audience, I am still an artist and a maker. That has transitioned some over the years as to how I create art and what I make, but the creative side of me is still very much there and present. So this is a little bit about like the timeline of my life over the last 20 years. Um, so going back to high school, I was actually not arts driven at all. Um, again, going back to my family, they're, they're first generation, a lot of first generation families see careers in doctors and lawyers and the obvious suspects and I was pre-med bound much like my siblings. Um, so I had an opportunity to do a summer program at Myad in Milwaukee, which was the summer before my senior year of high school. I always loved making things, I was always creative, but I didn't know that there could be um, a career or a future in that. It wasn't something that was really present in my, my family life or an example to me that I could take forward and create into something. Um, but that summer out doing the two month program at Myatt, I think I did figure drawing and photography, which was more than my high school offered. Um, I decided that it was about time to change course. So I switched high schools. I ended up going to a school in Milwaukee called Pius. It's a private Catholic school, but they have a great art program. And the, um, the main art teacher for that school went to Micah, actually. She was a painting major. So she pushed Micah hard. She brought Micah in to look at all of our portfolios. Um, she planted the seed of Micah early in my life. So I, um, I ended up applying to only art schools. My parents were not super thrilled about that. They were very much like, you're going to go to Cornell like your sister, and you're going to do something there. Um, but by spring of 2021, they let me apply to all art schools, and I ended up getting into MICA and got a phenomenal scholarship, um, and then moved out here um, to start my degree in fibers. So when I started, I didn't even know fibers was a thing. I come from a background of Eastern European where there's a lot of making, crocheting, 
um, embroidery, sewing, just a very like making craft community. Um, so I fell right into this at Mike. I was a weaver. Actually, every semester they let me take it, even though it was the same class every semester. They just kept letting me take it. Um, so I, was, I went to MICA in 20, um, 2001. I was supposed to graduate in 2005, but I had such a great time that I had a couple credits left to go and then decided to come back and finish those later after I went um, to the working world. So flashing forward a little bit, 2005 to 2008, I was, working, um, I was working in costume design as like a freelance costume designer. During the nights and the weekends, from, um, during the days I worked at a GYN office for insurance and just steady pay. Um, and then an opportunity came up actually through a connection that I had through MICA. So another alumni who I was in, was in my graduating class had gotten a job working at NASA Goddard. And they were at a time of plenty where there was a lot of missions happening. They didn't really understand the connection between art and science at that time, and they found this one individual that was a perfect combination for the type of work that they needed to be done. And I'll get more into details to what that is um, shortly. And so she reached out to me and she's like, hey, there's this really cool opportunity, it's really fun, I think you'd like it, why don't you apply? And I was like, I don't know if they're gonna pick me, it seems like a stretch. So I did end up applying, but I promptly moved back to Wisconsin. Um, put in my application, moved back home. Um, I had a sick grandmother that I was helping my parents with, and two weeks later I found out that I got it. So they graciously allowed me to spend the summer at home fulfilling my commitment to my family and then come back, and I started working at NASA Goddard in 2008. So like I mentioned pre just previously, is um, from 2008 to 2014 when I was at NASA Goddard down in Greenbelt, Maryland, um, first of all, Goddard and Greenbelt is one of the two space flight centers, so we build most of the hardware, at least during this time, there's a lot more activity these days, but we built most of the hardware that actually went to space. There's several NASA centers, but they all serve very specific purposes. We're a hardware-focused facility. Um, so I had an opportunity to start working there, and it was great. It was I was there for six years. I absolutely loved what I did. It was it scratched all the itches. I was creative, I was problem solving, there was a huge purpose behind what we did, it was challenging. It forced me to constantly learn, be curious, ask questions. It was just, I loved it. I, like, I had no idea that this was just round the beltway from where I went to school. Um, the one thing that I didn't love was that the environment wasn't it wasn't as positive always as I wanted it to be. And the other side of it was, is, the organization is built within a government contracting union. I was the youngest and the newest, and there, was never, there wasn't much chance for advancement growth, regardless of how hard I worked or how good I was. Um, and it became frustrating for me. So around that time, I decided, I'm like, OK, I'll go back to school and finish those two credits, those two classes that I need to, just get that off the list. Did that, and then um, finished that in like spring of 2012. And as I was finishing up, I saw something about the MPS program. I knew it was something they had been talking about for a long time, and I was like, this is great. Like, I've always had this entrepreneurial spirit within me. My, my grandfather, when he immigrated to this country, he started his own family practice. That Then he ended up being the first um, foreign doctor to be allowed to practice in the hospitals in Milwaukee. He ended up um, being the ringside physician for the 1980 Olympics. And he just, he was very much a powerful force that, like, embodies what an entrepreneur is, and, and that drove me. So I saw this come up, and I called Micah, and I was like, I just wanted to get more information. It was like April of 2012, and the program was starting in May of 2012, like a month later. They're like, well, we have some slots. Why don't you apply? And I was like, this is kind of like, I wasn't really ready for that right now. Um, but I did it anyways. I applied. I got in, and I figured, I'm like, you know what? I'm already back in school. Like, I already have all the momentum. I'll give it a shot. It was 14 months. It was somewhat somewhat accommodating to a working person. Normal working schedules, aerospace working schedules are not normal. So I applied, I got in, and I started the MPS program, um, which was a great program for me. Um, I was in the second cohort. I went into it not really knowing what I was gonna do coming out of it. I very much went into it with the idea of, I'm gonna let this be my new start. Whatever it is, I'm gonna create something out of this, I'm gonna turn it into something else. And um, Halfway through the program, I first half of the program, I thought I was going to start a restaurant or something in the food business because that's one of my passions. And I was like, I'm sick of this shop at Goddard. I'm going to do something totally different. 
And I had an awesome teacher at, in the MPS program, Bill Wernick. Um, he definitely changed the course of my entire life, quite frankly. He came from the government contracting world. Um, one of the things that program did really well was that they had a great mix of teachers. It wasn't solely creatives teaching creatives. They had a little bit of everything. It was a great collage of different teachers with different experiences so that you had a really well-rounded experience of what business is. And he came from traditional government contracting. Once He was my business management teacher. Once I got to his class, he was like, well, what did you do before you came here? And I was telling him, he's like, sounds like a really cool job. Like, why don't you want to do that? I'm like, well, I was kind of going into why and like, it's intimidating. I've only been doing this for six years. Am I really qualified? I'm not an engineer. Like, I gave him all the reasons. He's like, it seems like you're pretty successful and like you figured it out this far. Like, why not at least make it your thesis and use this opportunity to think it through? And I did, and I'm really grateful that I did. So um, going on to the next slide, I um, graduated from that program in 2013, and my thesis was AeroThreads. So I presented AeroThreads as a business in, with my business plan as my thesis. My logo actually was born out of that program. My company's name was born out of that program. One of my cohort class members, her company, who is graphic design, designed the AeroThreads logo. Um, so it, it's very meaningful for me. Um, so 2014, I waited the one year and three days that you needed to to not have to pay the union back for paying for part of your education. And then I bounced and started AeroThreads. Um, so we are approaching our 10-year anniversary now in August of 2024. And on this slide, you'll see this is my first office. This is um, our shop. We call it our shop in College Park, Maryland. Um, it's about 3,000 square feet that we kind of like squeezed together using different offices within one building. Our neighbor was M&T Bank, who ironically wouldn't give us a loan when we started. <laughs> um, and we had a space across the hall. This is a lot of the initial team. Several of people in this room, in this picture, are MICA grads. Um, we still have a lot of MICA grads that work for us as well as other art schools. Um, and this space served us really well up until 2019. Um, we've recently moved into a new space about 10,000 square feet down the road, um, Riverdale, Maryland, and we are quickly outgrowing that space as well. So um, another amazing opportunity that is MICA adjacent is the um, Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program. So back in 2016, 2017, I, got reached, I was reached out to by someone from Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program to apply for this um, program that they were hosting in Baltimore. It was the first cohort. I had apparently been nominated by MICA. I, to this day, I don't know who nominated me, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, to be honest with you, I thought it was spam because I was like, it was a lot of information. And I, reached, I ended up signing up for it, and I got in. It's a completely pre free program. If any of you are interested or you have friends or kids that are interested in this, I highly, highly recommend that you sign up for this. It's first class all the way. It's free, it's fast, it pushes you. It, it was great. It was another one of those things where it's like a perfect opportunity to take you to the next level. That, quite frankly, just kind of fell into my lap. It wasn't something I was looking for, but my eyes were open. And so I was part of the first cohort of graduates in 2017 for this, and I had an opportunity to meet all the founding members of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program. Since then, I've su supported and participated in many events, and the relationships and network that you build from organizations like this and communities like MICA are critical to the success of your own career, regardless of where you go. Um, so next up, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. It's, um, it's, it's the intersection of art and science. I believe that very strongly. I think you'll see through this story and through these pictures that it is that. Um, so we specialize in the design, manufacturing, and integration of thermal insulation for space, spacecraft or spaceflight hardware. Um, you might be wondering what is that and why do you need it? So thermal insulation is essentially closed for spacecraft. So anything that goes into space needs to be protected from the extreme temperatures and environments that it sees in space. We fall under what they call passive thermal control. That means that there's nothing active within our blankets, nothing like a heater or a cooler that's actively changing or controlling temperature. Rather, we, are the, we protect those active components. So most spacecraft will have some sort of active heaters, coolers, 
mechanisms in which to thermally control so that the structure doesn't break or crack or melt. And then we act as the insulation on top of that. Blankets have numerous purposes. Thermal is its primary, but there's a lot of them. There's electrical properties. There's contamination. There's micrometeorite orbital debris. There's deployables. We, it's, it's extremely complex. Um, it's extremely fun. It's extremely challenging. Um, and it's, it's very involved. So through design, we design in um, numerous different ways. We find that most of our designers come from the arts communities. We have a lot of creatives that are costume designers, patterners, um, we've had puppet makers, you name it. Anybody that can think of a shape in their head and unwrap it and flatten it and put it back together, those are the people that do really well in this because they're gonna look at a spacecraft and they're gonna birch, like wrap it up in their head and see exactly what it needs. They walk through the story um, and you find that in creatives. You don't find that in engineers. And so engineers are very literal. Like they are gonna design something in CAD that will work perfectly in a software application, but in reality it doesn't come together. And that's really where we intersect and where we find that we add value, extreme value to the industry as a whole. So we design through CAD, we design through drafting. So we do a lot of flat drafting where we'll take images and we'll just kind of draw it out. We design through draping, so actually putting material on hardware and draping the patterns out. Um, through that, we fabricate. Most people think that fabrication is like we're using some sort of heavy machinery. It must be super complex. It's really, it's, it's complex, but we're not using heavy machinery. We use surgical scalpels. So it's very sculptural, it's very handmade, it's very craft oriented, it's very attention to detail. All the things that, quite frankly, I learned and honed those skills during my time work at MICA. Being a weaver, you can't half-ass it. Like you're either making it right or you're not, it's not gonna come off the loom. So you kind of hone all of those skills in a community like this. And, um, and so we fabricate everything in-house in our location in um, Riverdale. We have about a dozen fabricators right now. We're working on getting towards 25 by the end of the year. Um, and everything is custom. Everything is one-off. Everything is like a little piece of art that flies. And then lastly, we install the blankets. So we travel all over the world to install blankets. Most of our customers are in Colorado, California. You mentioned JPL. We have an individual that's been, and she's a MICA grad, um, Morgan Betzel, if anybody knows her. She's been at JPL for the last year and a half supporting Europa Clipper, um, augmenting the JPL blanket shop. And um, we do all the final integration. Oftentimes, our team is the last team to touch the hardware before the fairing wraps around the spacecraft or the hardware, and then it launches. It's, ex it's really rewarding. It's exciting. Um, it's fun to see how art and science collide and how purposeful that is. And you'll find that to be true in many industries. Mine's one example of that. But there's a place for artists and artists and art in every industry. You just have to kind of find it. Um, this is who we are. So this is a little bit older of a shot, um, but we got a lot of MICA grads in here actually. Um, the Woman in the front with the peace sign, she's actually a MICA grad from probably 25 years ago. She was a graphic design major. I met her at Goddard when I started working there. Um, Allison Baskerville, another MICA grad. Um, got a couple art schools in here that are not MICA, but all creatives nonetheless. Um, and so this is kind of who, we make, who we're made up of. So we have furniture makers, mechanical engineers, CAD designers, fashion, costume, graphic design, product design puppet makers, weavers, sculptors, creatives that are not at, that don't come out of a formal educational system, people that just make, have made their whole lives. Um, we've started hiring aerospace engineer, engineers, technical apparel designers, that's kind of a newer thing that you're seeing more of, which is a great, um, great line of work for us to pluck from. We hire some from industry, not a ton, um, industrial designers and creatives, so. Thank you. Any questions? Thoughts? Any questions? How do you sell? Do you have a sales force? We, um, we sell mostly now through word of mouth. So most of our customers, there's not a lot of um, competitors in our industry. We're pretty niche. Um, so we sell to commercial, government, um, international, and we don't, we go to a few trade shows a year. But most of our customers come through our pipeline. Just FYI, we're going to have questions at the end? Yeah, we're going to have a panel. Okay, cool.
so people can ask you a lot of questions. Let's give another round of applause for Alex. Oh my God. That was so cool. That wasn't that cool. That was incredible to think that your MICA education can be the launch pad for almost anything your heart can think of, your mind can visualize, your heart can visualize, as they say, right? What the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. You can see what Alex has achieved here. It's so creative, so different than what she did her undergrad at MICA, her graduate education. And for those of you who are kids, whatever you do now, you don't know where it'll go from where you are, but it will give you all of the launching pad to take off with your MICA education, right? And for all of you who are here who are parents, who are here to support your brilliant, amazing, creative, talented, and bright kids, Look, Alex can be an incredible role model because you know what? Her parents came in from another country and being an immigrant myself, the most incredible thing about America is that we are a nation of immigrants, that we bring the best and brightest from around the globe here. And all of us can come in with a, almost not even a dollar most often in our pockets, but a dream to make a difference. And I'm sure now your parents and your family and your grandparents would be so proud of what you've done and accomplished, even though you're not a doctor or an engineer. And it's the same in India where I grew up. So I completely get it, Alex. Thank you. So next, I'm very honored and proud to introduce uh, our uh, third speaker, Winston Frazier, who graduated from MICA in 2016 with a BFA in painting. Completely different major, right? While still a junior, he had a pivotal experience during a summer travel intensive to the island nation of San Tome and Principe. And I had a chance to chat with him a little bit before uh, when we were introduced this morning. It was so fun to learn a little bit more about his background. After graduating, he and his fellow MICA alumnus, Austin Preppel, from the class of 2015, founded Dante Prosthetics to help amputees around the world embrace their lives through the ability to tell their story through personalized, unique, crafted prosthetic covers. Was that what they had on CBS Sunday Morning the other day? I remember seeing something. I was like, wow, cool. Maybe not your company, but if it isn't, then somebody stole your idea here. You might have a lot. I can get you a good lawyer who might give you a lot of money. Oh, <laughs> oh, good, okay, in that case, we might not run that lawsuit. But it's such a pleasure to, well, let's all give a warm welcome to Winston Frazier. Winston? Hi, everyone. Uh, so I graduated in 2016. Uh, it's been a wild ride since then. Uh, I spent a lot of my time here trying to get out of my major or get into another major, uh, I probably did that like five or six times, successfully, unsuccessfully, or just kind of slipping in under the radar and being allowed to, to stay where I was. Uh, and so I'm always exploring, I'm always trying to go somewhere I've never been, uh, which is very dangerous. Uh, you get in a lot of trouble, uh, but you also learn faster. Uh, so I have a great deal of experience and I grow quite quickly into new industries and markets because I kind of just crazily uh, jump into things that I shouldn't do that are regulated and, and eventually we learn uh, how to regulate ourselves and how to adhere to those codes and, and grow within that space. Uh, so I'm going to start from what I was doing when I was here and kind of chronologically grow through the art and the work I do now and, and to what is going on right now. Um, so I actually came into MICA as a photo major. Uh, so this picture was from my uh, really awesome internship I did with Derek Blanks and Derek was, uh, is a celebrity photographer and he's, you've seen his work on many album covers and and magazines and, and he was an old alumni who really uh, probably one of my first intros in the, into business and and I'd be holding equipment and he'd be like hey this equipment costs this much and, and this is how we charge the customer for that equipment and um, 
you know, I had no idea about that when I was here in school, like what business was, and, and he, was, he was a great teacher for that. So uh, I started, I kind of got into MICA doing uh, a little more exciting photo work than this. I was really obsessed with time-based, kind of everything I do is, is time-based uh, light photography. Uh, I do a lot of long exposures, and, and this is kind of more commercial, and um, I love color, and, and that's kind of what this picture represents. Um, very quickly, I loved that internship, but I did not like working with the people who were around uh, celebrities, uh, and I decided that if I was ever going to start a company like Derek, I wouldn't want my employees to have to deal with uh, the people around celebrities. Celebrities themselves were super nice. Uh, and so that kind of kicked me into, well, what do I want to do? And I started jumping around in, in different mediums. And, and I went into Photoshop's so always I have been like a big gamer and, and really big in the, into computers and software. And so software is something that, that is generally behind my thinking and, and behind what I do. So this was a, a piece I did my sophomore year. Uh, it ended up going into uh, a museum in, in LA at the time. It's probably my first actually like serious show. Um, and I had done, uh, my family, most of them are in the military and, and I'm from the DC area. So politics are kind of forefront of the dinner table. Uh, so uh, being a young child and experiencing the Iraq war was something I dealt with every day and, and had to talk about every day. Uh, and so that this piece is kind of about that. Um, I. The next major that I actually did, I was, and I ended with a painting major, even though I kind of technically didn't, um, is this is also kind of time-based. Uh, we, or I did, these really large abstract uh, paintings. I was really enthralled with uh, Larry Poons and Helen Frankenthaler, um, who were, well, Helen Frankenthaler was kind of a disciple of Pollock, who actually didn't like. Um, I thought his work was kind of uh, like it was a one-trick pony. And I thought uh, Helen Frankenthaler really spent a lot more time and energy in, into making her, her work kind of unique. Uh, so I think the biggest painting I ever did in, in this kind of fashion was seven by five feet. And most of my paintings were couple feet um, and I would I would paint usually I try not to stop uh, when I started a painting oh you can't hear me um, usually I wouldn't stop before I I, I finish a painting and uh, for that seven foot painting I think I did it in a 24-hour period and I took like I don't know two breaks um, and so that's kind of another time-based approach. I, I just want to get stuff done as quickly as possible and I get really laser focused on getting it done and I won't leave it. It like, annoys me to, to not have stuff finished. Um, and, and yeah. So this kind of gets into what I do now and, and I was really into animation. I think animation does a better job of explaining the human world than than the real events do and, and the, the real photos of the human world. Uh, so one of my favorite um, film series, Ghost in the Shell, and it, and it focuses on kind of what our future is going to be. And we're kind of entering that future now. Uh, and when we as a person uh, connect with machines and, and what does that mean for your humanity and your soul? And do you even have a soul? Does a machine have a soul? Um, I think uh, another film, The Animatrix, kind of uh, on the same vein, right? What, what do we do as humans when, when we let technology kind of replace our lives in, in, in our everyday? Um, I think machines do have souls, not that they like literally do, but you prescribe one to them. Um, and uh, that is in the vein of everything I do, um, the machines I work with. Um, they all have really funny names, um, and uh, every machine that we work with is named, and, and they all have their characteristics and their bad days and their good days, uh, which is really funny. So this is kind of more personal to me. I, I generally don't get to talk. I'm always working on someone else's dream, um, which I, I enjoy thoroughly, uh, but I, I end up not speaking about mine or, or being kind of close to home to, to what I really love to do. And, and personally, when I'm 
thinking about how I behave with technologies. It's, it's around cars. I'm a huge car guy. Uh, and so uh, to kind of, I'm really busy with work and I, I really don't have like a, a hand practice anymore. I used to mostly do everything by hand and drawings and paintings and stuff. So I've, I've been working with AI for a long time and whenever I have like an idea, I usually try and use AI to like speed up the process uh, to get the idea on paper and then kind of do iterations through that. Uh, and so uh, I've been kind of dreaming about building a house and, and when I do in the next couple of years, I'm going to start building a house, and it's really going to be a garage. It's it's not going to be like your your standard. You know, there's going to be some chairs and things, but like mostly, it's just to like support the cars inside of it. <laughs> uh, and I love cars. I they uh, you know I always give them names, and and I love how they make me feel. Um, there's just generally I kind of like walk around kind of depressed because I'm not who I am behind the wheel, right? Um, I always like kind of hate myself. I'm like, you're like, all your thoughts are slow. You're making decisions so slowly. Um, and it's because when you're driving at like 150 miles an hour, you have to make your decisions uh, roughly two miles ahead. So when you're driving that fast, you're, you're you know, roughly, I'm not a mathematician, uh, you're doing a mile every 20 seconds. Uh, so you have to make decisions about turns that are three miles ahead now while you also feel what's happening in the car now. Uh, and so I feel very connected and, and I become, I feel like one with the machine. You, you feel the, the spinning of the transmission, you feel the oil pumping through the car, you feel the rocks underneath your tires. And so um, I'm always like very upset when I'm not in that mode, which is any time I'm using my feet. Um, so that's what I like to do when I'm, when I'm not working super hard. Um, and uh, it's, it's everything about my life. And uh, unfortunately, I was given this disease by both sides of my family. Um, my family down south are all Harley people. So when I was you know, three years old, I was just getting put on the back of a Harley every day. And um, my uh, father's side, they're immigrants from from Sierra Leone, actually, and uh, my uncle, who's kind of like my dad, and and I'm kind of a spinning image of him. He started an engineering company in the 80s. Uh, about fourth year of that company, he kind of made it really big. He bought a 911, uh, and when I was five years old, he took me in it, and he said, don't tell your aunt what we're about to do, and I said, okay, um, and he kind of gave me this affliction. So I'll go through kind of there's some standard things I know probably everyone knows, but there are actually over 60 different ways to 3D print an object, and so that's what I do, right? That's, that's what I do every day. I do additive manufacturing. Um, we do some uh, subtractive manufacturing, but I really use other people to do that, so my main focus is on uh, plastic-based, photopolymer-based 3D printing and, and turning a plastic into an object, right? So everyone has probably seen this. You might have in your house or there here at MICA. Um, you know, this is FDM 3D printing, and it works by, you know, you heating a plastic, a polymer. Um, there's a bunch of different plastics you can, you can work with, and, and as it cools, you, you shape it into the shape that you're, you're working with. Um, I, we used to kind of mostly do this type of work, and we're pushing away from it because uh, it's slow. Uh, so I, I need kind of faster machines, and, and I need to pump out more units. So uh, I want to kind of get away from this technology altogether. Um, this we primarily work with. This is light-based uh, SLA 3D printing. So it works by uh, there's a lot of different materials and a, a lot of different kind of accents of how those materials can work. They can be flexible, they can be heat sensitive, uh, and uh, this one works with a laser. That's what that is going around in the circle. Um, and the bottom of this tray has a liquid polymer resin, uh, and when the laser hits the resin, it makes these new bonds in the plastic, and those bonds become physical. And so the plastic then becomes hard, uh, and we kind of can make any shape uh, with that laser. Um, this is works in the same way. Uh, clip or DLP kind of synonymous uses a projector like the we could use a projector that's showing this right now uh, and it's going to project an image uh, we call it a slice of an object uh, and so this is in real time um, this is getting printed and it's it's like it runs like a movie 
uh, the, the three-dimensional object and, and works really fast and uh, create lots of parts and, and that's why we kind of love using uh, machines like this. Um, this is my favorite, actually, technology in the additive space. Uh, so this is selective laser sintering. Uh, so the laser is above instead of below, uh, and that white stuff is uh, powdered nylon. Uh, and there's a bunch of different materials you can powder, plastics, but we generally work in powdered nylons because they're really durable uh, and for most uses uh, can be used for a lot of end parts and car parts and kind of whatever have you. So it, it, come, it comes down, it, it takes that powder, uh, melts it together, and so you have your object. Um, it's really cool. Uh, you get to cram as many objects into the build tray as possible. Uh, so we can get anywhere from large parts, maybe just a couple, but uh, I would say anywhere from 10 to 40, and, and small parts you can probably get around 2,000 parts. Uh, you print those parts in 24 hours and you know you stack your machines and then you can do 10,000 parts in, in a short time. Um, so this is actually a metal machine but it kind of works the same in software. You kind of push together um, uh, your, your objects and you can either let the software kind of tell you how best to do that or you can do it by hand yourself. And um, you have to exhume your objects. So you take what's called a cake, the powdered material out um, you exhume it and then you dust off your actual parts um, and it's one of the most green ways you can 3D print an object because um, all that powder pretty much we get to reuse it and we put new powder into it and so we're always running old powder in our machines 100% um, of the time unless there's some wild issue um, and it's, uh, it's one of the most eco-friendly ways to kind of create stuff so I, I really love it for that reason. Um, so this kind of, all the way back to Micah, this, this is my s painting senior thesis, which is not a painting, uh, and it's a 3D printed hand I started working on, and, and so when I went on that trip to Santa Tome, uh, which was this gorgeous island off the coast of Angola in Nigeria, and, and uh, we were doing everything we possibly could not to work and to just drink beer and sit on the beach. Um, I ended up, uh, we'd always been exploring, we'd always be going somewhere, and I remember the day, I, it was raining so bad, and uh, I saw this guy who's on the ground, he had one arm and no legs or no other arm, and he was crawling through the mud, and it kind of became this routine, I would go places and we'd see these amputees, uh, and you know, it's not because of war or anything, but they just have one hospital in the whole country, so if you're two hours away, you're probably not making it if you get in a car crash. To the hospital and you're going to lose the limb. Uh, and so that's what got me into this idea. I kind of came back and, and said I wanted to do something for them. And, um, you know, another trying to change major happened. Uh, and I couldn't really do that coming into my senior year. And I'd have to start all over again. I was like, do I go to Hopkins and stuff? And, and my teachers just decided to let me do whatever I needed to do. So I ended up physically being uh, at the station building kind of the whole time of my, my painting uh, uh, senior thesis and, and everyone was fine with that and, and the teachers were super supportive and I, I just can't thank them enough for kind of giving me the skill set and the mindset. They always challenged me to kind of be creative and, and solve problems creatively and, and just not live in a box. So that's the, the hand at work. Um, I, I thought it was durable at the time, it really wasn't. Uh, and that kind of led me into us making really durable things now. And, and um, you know, kind of I'll get into it in a second, but all of my successes are, are from massive failures and in either very long stretches, years of failures, months of failures, days of failure. So I'm, I'm generally every day dealing with some sort of failure, um, fixing it, and then uh, doing what I failed at a couple years ago really well today. Um, this was uh, a solution to a problem. Uh, we, I just came out of school. I had started Danae. Uh, we pitched Mike Upstart. We didn't win, right? So I'm a college grad. I have no money. I started a company. The company has no money. It has like $100 in its bank account. And we were like, okay, we need to make these really tall objects. What we started doing was working with amputees here. Most of them already had prosthetic devices, unlike the ones in Santa Tome. And, um, but a large problem for a lot of them is that when they walk around, people stare, especially kids, kind of stare at, at them and, and kind of treat them as like subhuman and, 
Um, one of the most awesome things I've ever done is I just allowed someone else to design what they wanted on their body. And so uh, we would work with lower limb amputees and we'd say, hey, we're going to take your sound leg and we're going to copy that, flip it, mirror it onto the other side of your prosthetic leg and you can design anything you want. And so every time we made something, it was never the same thing because it was always personal to that person. Uh, and so this machine we had built, so this is DLP, right? So we took a, that projector and we put it on the bottom. We put some photopolymer resin in there and, and that's what you're seeing as, as that light source. Um, and um, you know, we made this really tall 3D printer because I, I started shopping for a 3D printer that was this big. And they were like, hey, it's going to be 90 grand. I was like, well, I'm going to walk out right now. Um, and uh, it's not a problem we have anymore, but uh, coming out of college, it definitely was. So I, I guess that year, I, I'd become an entrepreneur. And, and it was super exciting, but it's also super daunting, um, especially because of the cash, right? You just, starting a business, you have to pay people. You have to do taxes. You, you know, I, I think I... Even this year, I was just like, wow, I pay more tax than I pay myself per month. Uh, and, and dealing with the highs and lows is, is a super daunting experience. Um, and it's uh, really brutal having a business. And, and anyone who has a business kind of knows um, that as an issue. My uncle, we, we kind of call each other. He's a client of mine now, which is hilarious. Um, but he just goes, hey, man, I've been... I've been trying to survive for 30 years, right? You want to, like, yo, you've been successful for 30 years, and he, he kind of sees it the opposite way, right? Like, I've just, I've just been treading water, even though he has a 40-people company. Uh, and so, you know, we've had to deal with a lot of that, too. Uh, markets change. Uh, once you're up, you're up, and then you get comfortable. And even though I've always worked super hard, there your brain just kind of goes, it goes in the kind of coast mode. and. And they're like, I'm here, and, and then things kind of start going down from there <laughs> because then you don't have the skills to kind of keep pushing up, and then you get to this bottom point, and then you start getting the skills to push up, and it, it's kind of cosine all the time. So I'd love to get out of that cosine and just, just straight line, um, but I'm too stubborn. I keep doing things that I shouldn't be doing, like running into markets that are super regulated without regulation, um, and then learning how to deal with that and then being regulated. Um, so it kind of gets into, you know, success is, is a bunch of failures in a row. Um, and I, I talked about this. We can skip this. Uh, this is our current place right now. So we're actually in the old Belsinger Sign Works building. Um, so this was a building that used to make uh, a lot of signs, and especially before in the 80s, 70s, um, you know, that, that's what you saw. Um, so they made the Baltimore sugar sign in here, Domino sugar sign, was was made in the in the space we operate in. So there's a lot of history, and, and I love kind of making the stuff I make now, and, and knowing that um, the world around me, because that's what I'm focused on making, was made in this building too. Uh, so this is over in Pigtown. Uh, it's about 34,000 square feet facility, uh, and kind of growing inside of it now. And uh, it's got a lot of holes in it, so when it rains, it really the bucket's got to come out. <laughs> Um, but uh, we're, we're plugging those holes and, and kind of we've been here for six months and it, and it kind of really feels like home. So it's, it's been a great experience. Um, so, you know, this is my company. So Denae is an additive manufacturing center. We do engineering as a service uh, kind of on the side. But we, we always run into companies, people who have ideas, problems that need to be serviced. And we make those parts for them. Um, we tend to print... We'll do onesie twosies uh, up to a couple of thousand and then generally kind of stop at 10,000 parts and we're trying to kind of grow into a million parts uh, as a business kind of in the next six months. Um, this is more about how we help our clients. Um, so we try and be a one-stop solution for them. Uh, I love people who come or, or bigger businesses that come with just an idea, right? Because I've worked and I've been a customer, I, I have, had those struggles and turn around to, to be the service provider for, for them, I can kind of tell them where they're going to be, where they're going to make pitfalls, when they're going to spend too much money. Um, we like to charge people who come to us after they work with someone else more money because it's more of a headache to work after someone's mess. <laughs> uh, so I'm like, come to me first or we're going to have problems. Um, 
And uh, that's generally how we work with everyone. And we work with Fortune 500 companies, uh, national sports brands. Uh, some national sports brands, we, we make every single thing that they sell in the market. Um, and so they kind of lean on us to, to give them our expertise and, and to tell them how to kind of move their products forward. Um, and that's generally just how I love to kind of work uh, with our clients. Um, so I, I touch everything from 3D printing to not, uh, to sheet metal, to tooling. Um, in every single industry, we've done jewelry, we've done aerospace. Um, uh, we're starting to do our first actual medical devices that need to be approved by the FDA. And um, it's, uh, I really love getting to work every single day. I wake up and, and it's like something new. I'm never doing the same thing ever. Um, and that's super exciting. It's, it's also the daunting thing. It's also the failure thing because uh, you're like, yeah, I can do this. And you totally can't or you're going to run into some issue that you didn't understand uh, in some market that you don't understand because you've never been in it. And, um, but that's how you learn, right? That's how we've gotten good at just seeing stuff and, and companies, pharmaceutical companies, kind of anyone comes to me and, and I always say I can do it even though I shouldn't. Um, and then we do it. So uh, CADs are the big backbone of what we do, some computer-aided design, um, working with our clients to, to make edits, changes, start from scratch, and a lot of our team um, has been from MICA, and, and we've worked with a lot of designers from here to kind of do that and, and work with clients to make new parts, um, which is a really exciting part, it's something I love to do. So when I was here, my unofficial major uh, change in the CAD and, and I just like spent every waking moment trying to learn how to design stuff um, on the computer and so it, it's a really important step in our process. Um, uh, it, you know, you, it works by drawing. It's, it kind of goes back to hand drawing, right? You have to draw everything out and that drawing has math attached to it. Um, and so that's what allows the computer to, to make a three-dimensional object, and then we take that three-dimensional object, send it to the printer, which also has code around it, which has math, and it kind of translates from nothing into something physical. Um, so this is uh, our, our secondary facility. Uh, we operate within a clean room now. We just have like one piece of equipment, but that's kind of, as of this month, kind of crazily growing. Um, we're, we're gonna be working on our third uh, medical device after just finishing our first one a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so this is in a clean room. Um, um, so it allows for us to do printing for medical device parts that um, our first one was a biological part that's gonna kind of go into hospitals. Um, we do a lot of 3D printing for pharmaceuticals. That, that's in the gray space where it's not considered a medical device so you kind of can do whatever you want. Um, but uh, kind of running into this, especially when I started, we started doing prosthetics. Um, you know, I didn't understand the regulatory landscape. Uh, and so it's, it's a very different way of working than when we work in our normal office. Uh, because in our normal office, we're really just concerned about making parts that are good and, and that work and that are durable. Um, and here, I mean, we have to do all those as concerns. Plus, we have to make sure that 10 years from now, if someone gets sick, uh, from a device that we made that the FDA can kind of trace it back to the exact time, the exact person, the exact material that was used um, so that they can control major issues. Um, it's how we found out the exact person who messed up 200,000 rounds of um, the COVID vaccine, right? So um, it's just a, a lot of paperwork and um, it's most of my day, unfortunately, but I'm starting to get good at it. So. Um, this was kind of in the middle. Uh, we just hit COVID, and uh, all, we kind of turned around all our printers into making masks. So my investor now uh, uh, has a lot of different businesses under. We kind of operate under this umbrella with 50 different businesses. One of those businesses does electro spinning, uh, and so what that is is you take plastic as a liquid, you electrocute it, and then uh, it turns that plastic into strands that are on the like micro level, and so. You know, we turn around and, and usually it, it's, you can use them for so many different applications, but turned around and made that machine make N95 masks, right? So they were doing yards, running kind of 24 hour operation to kind of handle everyone not having masks and then we'd 3D print 
kind of the vessel that held that, that nanospun material together. And um, I think we did three or four months where we were just popping out these guys left and right. And um, it was really great experience into like what our business can do. We can kind of turn on a dime and, and make solutions happen. Uh, some more just uh, starting with the prototypes, we made some really simple ones in the colored bag, and then they turned a little bit more serious and, and compliant with uh, NIH. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about some of the projects. A lot of them are under NDA, so I can't show them, but um, we get some silly projects, we get some really serious projects, and actually uh, we did these. These are actually prints, so they're full color prints uh, of all the executives of Microsoft. Someone thought it'd be funny to, to have them, <laughs> you know, print the person they work with and have them sit on their desk. Um, so I, I thought it was really cute. Um, so it was kind of a fun project. Um, this goes back to us designing, so we actually designed this as one of our kind of show pieces for the prosthetic covers and kind of shows what an amputee could have on their leg and, and, and what they wanted to. I'll show some of those in a second. Um, this guy uh, was a pain. Uh, it's really big and it's actually for one of the other companies that's on their umbrella of our investor uh, and so they make sonar equipment to detect um, the lives of shrimp. So a really big problem, if you own and operate a shrimp farm, you probably have a couple million to 50 million shrimp, and uh, how do you know if they're sick? You don't, right? You just, you have no idea because of the number. And so they use sonar to detect the, the population of shrimp, and so if, if that goes down by 100,000 shrimp in a day, you know you have a, a serious issue. Uh, and so we 3D printed this, and it actually went into the bottom of the ocean in Hawaii for several months. Uh, so that's kind of another, like, all the stuff we make, they just do such different things and it's a really big enjoyment. This was, we do a lot of restoration work or recreation work for parts that don't exist. I, I think it's, a, it's probably 20 to 40% of my business is, is uh, right now dealing, A, with China not being able to produce stuff or stopping to produce stuff and then car parts that are no longer exist, stuff like that. So. Uh, this body shop had come to us and they said, yeah, we have this really old Japanese car and, and I have one hubcap, I don't have any others, can you, can you help me? Uh, and so the part on the left is, is the original hubcap and the one is the one that we created, right? So uh, we can pretty much recreate anything exactly as it is and just add some paint to it and, and you know, you'll, you'll never know. Um, this was, I can't remember what tool this was, uh, another engineering firm that come to us, same problem, it's made in China, it doesn't get made anymore, and so that's the purple part, uh, and so we kind of cleaned it up, laser scanned it, cleaned it up in CAD, remade it, and got it printed for them so that they could use it. Um, most of the work that we do like this is actually for Fortune 500 facilities. Uh, same problem, can't get it made quick enough or needs to be kind of made differently. Uh, and so for one of the largest warehousing companies in the world, uh, we do a lot of that work where we've made uh, probably 10,000 parts for them that were we designed by us um, that helps them save you know, $40 per unit, which turns into a lot of money um, at the end of the day for them and, and speeds up their operations and gets them uh, moving when they can't move. Uh, a big problem for them was just uh, human error and destroying machines, and so the, the thing that we made for them helped them, helped humans stop destroying those machines or keep the ones that were destroyed running, which hits their bottom line significantly and uh, is, is actually the biggest uh, driver of our business. This was a, a medical model. Um, we laser scanned it. Um, this guy's from a long time ago. Uh, so we do a lot of medical models, and um, I just love laser scanning because just how detailed it can it can be, right? Um, and and just uh, putting those parts back together. Uh, we got to print this guy and uh, strung him up and kind of put him back together bone by bone, and it was really fun. Uh, this was. Uh, a, a talk from, uh, I did a talk probably last year at the Smithsonian. Um, we got our prosthetic covers into the Science Art and Art Museum for the Future Show, um, which was really wonderful experience. We were with Google and all the big uh, companies um, that were doing something around the future. And so we actually got our prosthetic cover put with the first prosthetic ever made in the world. Um, so the dichotomy of that was uh, really cool and it was a show that ran for about a year and a half 
uh, another medical model, uh, NIH model. And uh, on the side, uh, not really business related while we were doing this, we uh, connected with the ABLE Foundation and, and we were able to kind of take, give a certain amount of the material that we were using uh, to them for free and, and we'd make prosthetic hands for, for people who didn't have fingers. Um, and so we did a lot of these and, and it's something that is just really great about being able to just choose to, to manufacture something whenever you want to. Um, and obviously the whole team was behind it and, and I, I really enjoy some of the stuff we've just been able to give away just by having a machine, right? Um, so this is uh, one of the amputees that we worked with and, and he's a, a double amputee, uh, one, one's below the, the knee, one's above and so he, he's a photographer and so his covers, you can't really see them here, but uh, he has like uh, pick art, right? Like, you know, like the the really uh, simply drawn 90s like clippy. He has a bunch of those on his leg. So I thought it was really cool. It was really interesting. And, and it's kind of just that customization that people choose and, and how personal it is to them only is, is amazing. Um, and so this is Caitlin. Um, she's uh, been in the, a bunch of, she's done a lot of firsts. Uh, she was in the Olympics for boxing for skating after she had her accident, uh, and her prosthetic limb is actually dragon scale. And so she wanted something, she'd go to galas and the grocery store, and she's like, I just want something that's cool, and I can wear with a dress, or I can wear at home. Uh, she like never takes this thing off, and this was the actual cover that we had in the Smithsonian. Um, and love working with her, and, and it's kind of, you know, I'm always working on someone else's dream, so it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, but thank you. I won't be as talkative as Sheila. Um, <laughs> Gerald Gibbs is coming up next, and he's an amazing painter. Oh, look. Gerald Gibbs is coming up next. He's an amazing painter. He did the Elijah Cummings painting, which is an amazing thing, which if, which if you live in this area, you've probably seen, or if you've visited the Capitol. Um, he's in many exhibits. He's had many exhibits, and um, his work speaks for him quite a bit. Um. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. Um, okay, where do I start? There we go. Okay, so my... Um, my journey to getting to this point is extremely unconventional. Um, I'll start with my undergraduate experience. Um, I began college at Morgan State University, which is, which is uh, an HBCU in East Baltimore, if you're not from here. Um, by the way, I'm born and raised in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, yes, indeed. <laughs> Um, I'm just grateful that I was able to come to MICA, get my education, and be from here. Like, that really means a lot to me. Um, so, initially I went to Morgan State University. Um, I went for all of the wrong reasons, because uh, family and friends had suggested that that's what I should do, because I really didn't know at the time what I wanted to do with my future. Um, so, went to Morgan State, um, played around a lot. Did a lot of partying, had a great time. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, my grades um, reflected my partying. <laughs> By the way, I have four slides, so we're going to breeze through this. I know we're kind of short on time. Um, but anyway, my grades reflected all the partying that I was doing at um, Morgan State University. Uh, and because of that, um, the following uh, what are we in? spring of the following year, I decided that it was time to leave and kind of get my act together. So this is where things started to shift for me. This is a picture of me um, as a football player at Bowie State University, which is another HBCU. Now, uh, Bowie State is um, going towards Southern Maryland, like right before you hit DC, if you're not familiar. Um, decided to go to Bowie State so that um, I would 
be able to get away from not my family and friends, but just kind of separate myself from the environment that I was accustomed to in order to uh, get to a point where I could focus on my goals and things that I had um, set for myself. So I go to Bowie State and um, man, it's so amazing how life works. <laughs> Got to Bowie State and um, the fall of the year that I was going to school, my wife, Sheila, who you'll see in the next slide, uh, called me while I was in football camp and told me that she was pregnant. So, um, I mean, like right then in that moment, you really don't have too much opportunity to think about anything. I'm in the midst of fall football camp and I'm finding out that I'm about to be a father. <laughs> So um, I push on through the fall semester, and then uh, spring of the following year, um, I decided that it was in my best interest to drop out of college again, because I dropped out of Morgan State, transferred to Bowie State. Now I'm dropping out again at Bowie State. Um, now, I went to Bowie State to play football, but I was also there um, studying sports management. All of my curriculum surrounded by uh, surrounded um, education was surrender, um, surrounded everything that I went to school for at the time was centered around management in sports, uh, business management. I've always been business minded. It was something that I wanted to do from um, for as long as I can remember as a kid. Um, but when I found out Sheila was pregnant. I knew that I had to do the best thing for my family moving forward, which at the time was to get another job. So I dropped out. And amazing story, I was actually in class when I made this decision. So I was in my sports management class of all classes. And um, I'm sitting there and I'm like, bro, like, this isn't going to be the way for me. Like, this is, I'm not really committed to like what I'm doing. This is not going to put me in a position to take care of my family. So I need to make a choice. So uh, um, right in that moment, <laughs> I got up out of my chair and I left. I hopped on the train and I went back home in Baltimore. And ever since then, like things just started to shift and change for me. Um, let's go to the next slide. This is my family. This is um, Sheila on the far, far left, Reagan, our daughter. And uh, it's me. This is our, um, wedding, one of our wedding pictures. Uh, Reagan is 13 now, so she's almost taller than me, so. <laughs> but this is like one of my favorite pictures of all time of us together. Um, so going back to the story, I'm on the train on my way home, and I'm like, all right, now I got to find a job because I got to take care of my family. So uh, get back home. I end up connecting with um, a few uh, friends of family. They find some opportunities for me. I start um, working, uh, doing direct care. So now I'm doing direct care, and I have two, two jobs, doing direct care, doing a day and night. So I'm working from um, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., and my second shift is from 11 uh, p.m. to 7 a.m. So I did that for about two and a half years. Now, before we go a little further, I want to kind of like preface what I'm about to say with who I used to be as a child. So coming from Baltimore um, and coming from the community and environment that I'm, I'm from, Baltimore City in particular, um, art wasn't a thing. You know, like for me growing up, I was either unfortunately a drug dealer, an athlete, or a rapper. And fortunately, I didn't choose any of those paths. But what I will say is, when I was a child and I had the opportunity to draw, which I was really passionate about, I spent a lot of time drawing characters and, and, and watching um, cartoons. And Allen Iverson was one of my favorite basketball players, so I was drawing him a lot. Um, I would sell my drawings to like my family members. And it was cool and cute. You know, they would buy for like 25 cents or whatever. And, um, but I never really had that support. You know, like, there was never anyone saying, like, hey, you should continue to think about, you know, like, furthering your career in that or, like, really 
take some classes or anything because it wasn't an opportunity. Like the level of exposure in, in my community at the time surrounded by art just wasn't there. So I didn't have the support and I left it alone for a long time. Now fast forward, I'm at my second shift um, from 11 a.m., I mean 11 p.m. to uh, 7 a.m. And I have a picture of my family, of specifically uh, Sheila and Reagan, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, damn, I wanna draw that. So I just naturally draw the image, right? Do, I, I do about a 30 minute sketch and then I take a picture of it and send it to Sheila. Now Sheila says, um, wow, that's a beautiful picture. Who drew it? And I said, I did. And Sheila responds with, no, you didn't. And I said, well, who else would draw a picture of you or Reagan? <laughs> and then she said, wow, I never even knew you could draw. And I said to her, well, to be completely honest, I forgot that I could. So from that point on, I continued to draw. And I got back into it, and I was doing it every day, and every opportunity that I had, I was drawing and drawing and drawing. And the following year, she decided to get me a um, easel and painting supplies as a Father's Day gift. So this was in 2014. And all of this is, the reason I'm showing you these slides are also because my family is what I'm talking about in my works. Like my family is my everything and my community and where I come from are the experiences and the um, events that I'm documenting and, and talking about within my paintings. They're very important to me. These are photos of, um, photos that I use as source materials for a lot of my paintings. Um, I found about 12 to 15 photo albums in my aunt's basement in 2016. And I just went crazy and started to use these as source materials, which kind of was the jumping off point for me in terms of really understanding what I was interested in portraying, uh, what I really wanted viewers to experience when they saw my works. Um, a lot of these are photos of my family. Some of are people that I don't know necessarily, but were a part of my upbringing, were a part of my um, community, were a part of whether they were related to me or not, they were friends of family, so they were in our household, et cetera. Um, so this is initially where it started. And the good thing for me is because I'm, uh, I was in Baltimore and because I was spending a lot of time perfecting my craft and painting like every day, I came upon um, a guy named Sean Coffey Holmes who I actually ironically was working with at the time. We were working, the, he was working the, the morning shift, the direct care uh, position that I had. He would work the eight, a.m. to four shift and I would come in after him and we would exchange information and talk here and there but it was one night in particular we just sat down and we had a conversation and he told me about his interest in art and I just so happily spoke up about my interests and that developed a relationship from there and then from there he introduced me to Jeffrey Kent and I'm not sure if anybody else is familiar with Jeffrey Kent but Jeffrey Kent is also a graduate from MICA, from the uh, Leroy School of Painting, Leroy Hofberger School of Painting, like myself. He was, and still is, a mentor of mine, and he was the one who gave me um, the inspiration to go to school in the first place, to get my master's degree in fine arts, specifically in painting. Um, Jeffrey, um, applied to MICA without an undergrad degree, just like myself. And um, once he told me that it was possible and he showed me that it was possible, I went for it. So I give a lot of credit to Jeffrey. Um, by the way, I got into MICA in 2018 with no undergraduate degree, no formal training, and um, yeah. I got in on a small year at that. I think the painting program that year was only accepting six students. So I got in, um, I was one of six out of 300 plus applicants that year. So 
I'm grateful for that. <laughs> um, this is a painting that is really personal to me, which began, um, this was like the starting point of a series of works that I did. And this is titled um, Boy in Yellow Shirt, but the boy in particular, I don't know who this boy is, but I saw the photo of him and um, I really just resonate, resonated with him. I started looking at this image in 2020 during COVID and that was the year that um, I actually graduated, 2020. So I'm spending a lot of time looking through these photo albums and I find this young boy and um, I really resonated with his disposition in a way that he was um, just standing in the photo and it reminded me of myself. So within look, while looking at this uh, photo, I started to really like question myself and, and, and want to dig deeper into who I was and my history and my personal narrative. And uh, again, my paintings are really centered around my personal experiences and finding um, what is important to me uh, because what I realized when I'm working from within, when I'm thinking about my personal experiences and the things that I've been through, I'm able to access something um, that I'm not able to if I'm looking for sources on the outside, if that makes sense. Um, so this boy in particular really resonated with me. He allowed me to look within myself. Um, I ended up doing an entire series about 15 works that were centered around him, but they all were really an exploration of myself. And last but not least, this is um, a, most, a more recent work called Jump. And this really speaks to where my practice is today. Um, really thinking about the representation of uh, black men in particular and being portrayed in spaces that we're not necessarily depicted in. Um, being surrounded and, and, and uh, being associated with uh, beautiful things like flowers, thinking about uh, travel, thinking about being at, um, in a space of solitude and peace. Um, I really want to change the way that people uh, receive and view black men um, because our experiences are not singular and um, we, um, we have a very, a very um, deep experience that I think a lot of people need to see in order to uh, appreciate. Um, this also speaks to the way that, um, I, that I create my works as a painter. I'm really interested in the materiality of the medium. Um, so if you look closely at the works or have the opportunity to see them in person, um, they're very painterly. They're, they're, I'm thinking about abstract and figurative language at the same time. I'm thinking about how to convey an experience through the medium of paint. So it's not a, a complete um, replica of an image, but it's, all, it's almost like painting a sensation so the viewer can experience it in the same way that I am um, and from my perspective. Uh, again, this was a quick and short presentation um, and I ran through this, but thank you for your time. How about another round of applause for all of these incredible <laughs> alumni? So I'm gonna invite our speakers to come up uh, to the front table here, grab a, uh, grab a chair, and, um, and open up some time for, um, for a Q&A. Um, before I do that, I just wanna remind folks that there are um, a number of activities happening today after um, this program. So there's uh, open studios around campus and there's a little um, sheet at the front table that talks about the open studio so you can go into some of the classrooms. Um, there's um, open studies um, which um, is the site for the master's program that Alex was talking about. They're having a um, information session and some, um, some alumni uh, work in the main building. Um, there's the grad school exhibition that's going on at the Lazarus Center um, down on North uh, Avenue um, and the cookout tonight. Uh, 
which is going to happen from uh, 5.30 to 7.30. It's going to be inside. Uh, is that right? In Maine? Um, and so, um, and then finally, TT the Artist at 8 o'clock tonight. So those are the announcements. We've got our panel here. Um, I invite you to ask questions. I think there's a, there's a mic here. So um, if you raise your hand and have a question, anyone? Okay, so I'll, I'll start off. Oh, no, they're down in the, down in the back. So we'll, we'll start with your question. First, I just want to say, like, so amazing. Everybody's just talking points were so amazing. I feel like I just watched, like, <laughs> yeah, I feel like I should, like, have, like, coffee, watch, like, Downton Abbey or something. Like, it was really amazing. Um, I just want to say, I noticed there was, like, a common thread behind each speaker, and I've noticed that, like, um, art was not necessarily the first avenue for everyone, but everything is art, everything is political. So my question is, in what ways do you feel like all the other things, and some of you already talk, touched on it, but all the other things you experienced in your life allowed you to make art like your first discipline, your first love, and how do you feel like those other things you've experienced has inspired your work? Yeah. So, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. This is kind of a, I don't know, probably a bad answer, but uh, <laughs> this one's bad. Um, so, a little secret with painters, most of them are really depressed. Uh, and so, I was extremely depressed, and that's the only way I had an avenue to like express myself at the time. Uh, and I guess as a common thread, the reason why I was depressed is because I wasn't getting what I wanted out of life, and so I create things to get what I want out of life. I'll try to answer this on the best that I can. Um, for me, I'm a passion-driven person. Like my whole day is spun off of like what is driving me that day. What's my passion? Um, and I, while I loved, loved creating, I loved making things. Um, I deviated from a very like regimented four-year college program because I wanted to create my own. Um, and I found success in doing that. And I guess I just learned to believe in myself along the way, so the two came together. Um, I guess for me as a designer, um, uh, I guess the common thread that I see in my career is about um, how do I apply my, as a designer, a design identity or design practice to influence the community around me. And I think that was initially seeded uh, from the graphic design department at MICA. Um, at that time, there was, um, uh, you know, the JHU and um, MICA graphic design um, courses that sort of emerged the design and community building. So uh, stemming from that, I think, um, became sort of a theme to sort of explore and apply and experiment with design practice in terms of how I can influence direct community to larger community. Um, I would have to say, uh, one, like I said uh, during the talk, um, I was born with the gift that I have in terms of um, being able to replicate what I see and put it on paper. But I just wasn't able to access the gift until I got to a point where I had to make a decision to do it, if that makes sense. And I had to get to a point where, through my life experiences, I was forced to make a decision um, that went beyond myself because of my family. You know, I was at a, I was at a, a point in my life where it was either this or that, you know what I mean? And sometimes when you're in those spaces, or when you're in that, when you're faced with that type of reality, um, you're able to access something deeper within. Um, and something that I wanted to say earlier is, be patient with yourself too. And I, I don't know who this is for, but I just feel like I gotta say it. Be patient with yourself. I didn't know 
what I really wanted to do until I turned like 26. Um, and if I would have listened to everybody else, I wouldn't have been doing what I'm doing today. So um, just have that patience with yourself and have the courage to kind of go against the grain and do what's um, important to you. It's really evident from each of your presentations how important the practice and the community of people practicing together is at MICA. But listening to Jeremy's excitement about his first few weeks, he talks about the history of art class and how inspired he is to learn that there is a history behind the kinds of things that they're already exploring. And you know, when I look at this work, I think, you know, Romir Bearden and, and other historic figures. I wonder if anybody can just like reveal how standing in a place where you're both inheriting a past but also creating for the future uh, is inspiring your work. Um. Can you repeat that question, please? I heard, I heard all of it until the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got you. Well, I'm a history buff. Like, I love everything about history. Um, watching movies, reading, I'm into all of it. I study a lot. Um, before I before I got to Micah in 2018, um, I was studying like to the point where I was looking on YouTube and just finding any video that I could surrounding painting, the topic of painting. It didn't matter who it was. Um, but I, what, I, what I was able to, what, what I appreciate about history and, and, and studying the past to help me uh, as a starting point to the present and future is having somewhere to start. You know what I mean? Like, for me, it gives me, the past gives me an opportunity to, to look at something and to appreciate it um, from a different point of view, from a different perspective. And after I'm able to experience it um, and digest it and see what the, um, hypothesis was at the time and what they kind of concluded after going through certain things, now I'm able to um, apply that to where we are today and what I'm experiencing today and how um, I relate to that past and how I can um, kind of put myself into the present and future, if that makes sense, and add my experiences um, to, the, to, the, uh, to the conversation about whatever it is in particular I'm looking at. Does that answer your question? I think I went around the whole world just to, all right. <laughs> um, I think the history part is like the most important thing for art, especially because it teaches you stuff very quickly. Uh, and it teaches you how to get somewhere fast. I have like two different things around this. So one, uh, I, when I started painting, I was really into Basquiat, right? And I learned his brushstrokes really fast. Um, and so I started copying him, and I started doing that as a framework to get to where I was trying to go. I, I, I would consume an artist, right? I, I'd look at every single piece, I'd sit down in front of it and, and just drink it in, and I'd copy the crap out of him. Um, and I would learn stuff, and I'd, I'd be like, oh, this is great, this is not so great, right? Like. Helen Frank Thaler, amazing. Larry, um, Jackson Pollock, I hate him, right? And then you, you get to this place, right, where you're like, okay, I've consumed this, I am this, I'm doing it, and then you do the next thing. Uh, and I think especially, too, for me getting into the Smithsonian, I stood there in awe, and I was like, how do I get into the Smithsonian? Uh, it's so amazing, all these people kind of drinking in these paintings. And one day we were at the BMA, it was like one of our history classes for art, and I straight up just asked the curator, I was like, how do you get a BMA? And everybody in my class laughed. 
and I went to my teacher after, and I was like, why did everyone laugh at me? And she's like, they're not laughing at you, they all wanted to ask that question, right? And so, yeah, it's a framework. Hi, um, in this kind of confusing world, yeah, we, we tend to feel the, the vibrations are getting tense here and there and you know, out, out of doors. And of course, art is, a, is sometimes a, a solve for that. Um, in, in what you guys do, do you ever pause and think, uh, you don't have to, but I'm just wondering if you do. Uh, do you ever pause and think, can I use my tools for a day on kind of manifesting peace or some serenity? And if you do think about that, how, 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 how do you go about that? Um, okay, we're gonna get into politics. Uh, through maybe my art practice and just through living the world, I don't think peace is possible. Um, I think that if every single person, seven billion people chose peace, there'd be one guy who didn't. Uh, and I think the best that we can do is, is for you to be your most authentic self. Um, and kind of weirdly enough, too, that's like, I think aliens exist, but I don't think we've ever met them because they probably just like try and take us over, right, for resources. I just don't think it's in our nature not to like fight each other. Uh, and weirdly enough, that's probably what has kept our society or our societies going as humans is that we fight over resources and we're always constantly focused on the most technologically amazing things that we all live with, refrigerators, cars, uh, piano wires, all that stuff. Most of that started in the military. So it's just, it's, it's life, unfortunately, and, and I used to be very opposed to war, and not that I'm not opposed to war now, but it's just something I more live with today. I'll kind of follow that. So a lot of our customers are, um, defense, to be honest with you right now. There's a lot of um, advancement in military and exploration and a lot of other fields in space. But we're seeing a big uptick in military. And I think in some ways, like there is a need for some amount of friction because that's where growth comes. It drives technology, it drives need. It's not always positive. Um, but I will say that our team as a whole is proud to be a part of driving growth and being part of technology and, and participating and sharing their creative solutions towards it. Um, now that my practice sort of evolved into consumer, um, consumer products, I don't, I was just kind of thinking about how I could be answering this question. Um, but I think um, just, you know, as we experience so many different things in life and over a course of time and history, um, uh, and, you know, as a designer even, um, that role tend to get somewhat blurred or confused at times of, you know, what is my role here? I'm more embedded in than ever before, before where a graphic designer was very clear in who you are, but then now that you are sort of embedded in so many different contexts and situations and that um, that you get a seat at the table, but at the same time, um, that, that role tend to get sort of uh, blurred and confusing. But I think, I think what um, helped to sort of um, carry through in the flux of many things that's changing around us, whether that is, that's our culture or you know society or politics and so on. I think just remaining, holding to that truth of who you are as a as a person, but at the same time your identity as a designer, like that doesn't change. I think even if I'm in consumer product industry or whether I'm in like nonprofit or when I, whether I'm in the government sector, that, that, that person who I am um, in that context is always a designer and then designer at, at the core is about caring for the others and making sure that we can 
um, bring that um, empathy perspective into whatever we do. Um, I think that's sort of been the uh, driver and I try to uh, share that point of view a lot and remind the designers a lot in my team and elsewhere I go. Um, Um, I think uh, peace is something, in my opinion, that you have to experience from within. It's not something that you're going to um, access from outside sources. And again, this is my opinion. Um, I believe you have to do the work um, for yourself in order to get to the point where you have peace. And there's nothing that I can do to bring you to that state of mind. But my work, what I plan to do and, and work to do with my work is to offer an opportunity for people to have conversations and dialogue around what they're seeing and to be able to um, share my perspective and hopefully um, you engage with, you as the viewer engage with my perspective so that you understand that there's not just one perspective, if that makes sense. Because I feel like when we have the opportunity to speak and talk and, um, and share thoughts and ideas, we're less fearful and um, less defensive, if that makes sense. So, sorry. So during uh, y'all's Sorry, I'm from Texas, y'all. Uh, journey entrepreneurially, can you describe some of the biggest challenges? Did you experience any self-doubts? How did you get through that and navigate those challenges and uh, obstacles? Taxes. <laughs> <laughs> That's been my biggest challenge, taxes, <laughs> yes. And I've worked through that by um, being charged interest rates. <laughs> so I learned quickly that I need to do that immediately and on time. Um, I think <laughs> another thing for me, in all seriousness, last year um, was pretty difficult in terms of creativity because I was, um, spending a lot of time focused on, again, things that were out of my control and things that, um, I was spending a lot of time focused on everybody else other than myself. And it made me forget what my values and, and what my, um, my um, goals were. And because of that, it made me operate in ways that weren't in alignment with what I want for myself and my family. So in terms of entrepreneurship, taxes is important, but I also think um, for me, learning that my values and um, my goals have to be in alignment in order for me to be at a space where I can continue to create and be confident and comfortable with what I'm producing, if that makes sense. say the, the, the success or the core of the entrepreneurship or you know doing your own business I think is the community um, making sure that you're surrounding yourself with the right community who um, sees you for what you want to pursue um, believes in your goals and missions and um, and effectively leveraging those communities to carry your um, vision forward I think it's um, it's one of the uh, greatest and valuable assets you would have as an entrepreneur. I'd say for me, um, definitely there's always a lot of self-doubt. I mean, you're constantly pushing yourself to do more than you did the day before, to try something that you haven't done before. Um, you're often stepping outside of your own, your own knowledge base and your own strengths to create where you need to go. Um, there's a certain amount of grit that you learn to possess as an entrepreneur. 
um, you pick yourself up quickly and move forward. You surround yourself with a, a strong team, um, mentors, and I would go back to grit. I think that's the biggest thing is, is like at the end of the day, you're, you know you're not gonna have every answer, but you have to be able to believe in yourself that you're gonna figure it out. And that's something I had to learn really quickly, really quickly when I started AeroFreds. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. Uh, crazy amount of doubts, right? Because you've just never done it before. Everything you, you do, you end up doing, you've never done, right? And the things you need to do next, you've also never done. Right, so uh, right now I'm like, oh, I haven't made a million dollars this year, and it's eating my soul. Uh, seven years ago, I made like 200 bucks, right? <laughs> and I was like, I need to make $200. Like, I need to like pay for these stamps, right? That was my issue then. Uh, and so every year, it's 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 you solve those old problems, and the, you know, making a thousand dollars is is I don't think about it, right? I used to think about that every second a couple years ago. Uh, and so it's just, it's, it's a brutal tour de force of the soul, not, you know, living in this constant, never done it before. Um, and the way that I handle it is I just, I just spend a lot of time with people who've done it, right? I, I, I seek those people out constantly. I call them. Um, and, and uh, you know, someone real close to me, you know, he, he raised like $50 million. He called me that day. He was like, how can I help you? And I just surround myself with the people who've done the thing that I haven't, and the people who say, I tell them my dreams, and they say it's really easy for them to do. They're like, oh, it's super easy. Uh, and through that, you start to realize like where you are holding yourself up, um, and how to get yourself unhung up, and then to do the thing. I, I wonder if you could amplify on those answers just a little bit, and talk um, about how being in an art and design college helped prepare you for those kinds of um, const kind of constant renewal, constant um, uh, pivots uh, that you've had to make through these careers that that you've uh, that that you've engaged in. Yeah, uh, I think that's the, like the strongest thing about going to school here. It's like, I remember, what was it? Ken T's a sophomore year. I think it was a drawing class and I started painting. I was doing a bunch of random things. And every time I brought something, sculpture, I did welding, I picture, whatever, it's a drawing class. He called it painting, every single thing. I was like, why is this guy calling everything a painting? It's because it didn't matter, right? And it was like expressly about the ideas. Uh, and I think the teachers are really, really good about not caring about the medium and, and just worrying about the purpose of what you're doing and, and supporting that purpose. So that's kind of the strength of going to school here. For me, I think that a lot of what you learn in a school like this is to be a creative problem solver. My siblings all went to traditional four-year schools. They're vets, surgeons, nurses, and everything's learned through a curriculum. There's, there's a book that taught you how to do this, to solve this problem, to solve that problem. A school like this teaches you to create your own solutions to the problems that you create for yourself. It gives you the tools and a framework to be a problem solver and to create. It gives you, I think, a broader capability of figuring things out than you get from a traditional four-year college. Um, I think that's a huge thing for me, and I find it to be true with all of my creatives in the company. And that's one of the things, one of the biggest assets to what we bring to the engineering world is like they look at things so literally, and sometimes it's sitting right in front of them, but it's because they can't break it apart and put it back together, their brain, they just don't work that way. So I think it's a huge, huge advantage. And completely underutilized a lot of times. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. <laughs> um, that um, it's just the way you problem solve. Um, it's a frame of um, problem solving and utilizing your creativity on a daily basis and having that as your you know, foundational, um, uh, you know, skill before you go out into the world um, that allows you to uh, stay flexible, um, be okay about um, ambiguities um, in different type of career settings or what you want to pursue and 
Um, and I think another thing would be that, um, like a community, um, I, I would have to say that every point in my career path, I've either crossed paths or sort of handed off, like uh, became sort of a touch point of like transitioning to another MICA alum. So for instance, the LA Mayor's uh, innovation team when I was um, resigning and trying to go for another thing and um, uh, another grad from social uh, design, uh, MFA program here, um, Diana Williams, I believe, uh, she took on that role. Um, and it's just that community, doesn't matter, East Coast, West Coast, <laughs> wherever you go, you, you find them. and. Um, and uh, you know that also sort of carries you through as you uh, go through your career path. And yeah. um, I would say uh, the programs um, are very rigorous, right? And I think because of that, it develops your confidence within your practice. And when you have confidence within your practice and your own voice that you have kind of um, cultivated through um, dialogue with your cohorts and your professors here, you have the opportunity to step out into the, the, the real world and not really be affected by other people's opinion. Um, and I say opinion because there are going to be a million opinions, but the reality is when you can back up whatever it is that, you're, that you have done or what you have offered and created, there should be a level, um, there should be healthy dialogue and conversation to it as though you can, um, you have the opportunity to express what it is and how you feel about what you've done and the facts behind it to back it up. and the other people who have their opinions or whatever they may be, they can have those opinions, but you can still stand on knowing that you have confidence and that you know what you know from this rigorous experience that you're gonna get because it's gonna be a challenge, but you will be prepared, I promise you. <laughs> Hello, um, I attended an HBCU, so I was just wondering, do you find any similarities or any parallels between HBCUs and MICA as well? In a sense of like vigorousness and like being prepared for the world, like um, going to Howard, I feel like it was a, it was like simulation, like mm -hmm. we're all black, we're all like, is the best of the best. And then when you get into the real world, it's like, oh, I have to deal with other people and it's different. So like. Do you see any um, similarities there? You know what? If I was a better student at the time, <laughs> I would probably be able to answer your question. Um, <laughs> being completely transparent, because while I was at school, while I was at Morgan, and while I was at Bowie State, I was playing, you know what I mean? So I wasn't paying attention to the stuff that I needed to at the time. and. Um, but what I can say is both experiences, the similarity that I, I do, um, that I'm able to kind of like think about right now is the cohorts and the relationships that you build. Like the relationships that I built at Morgan, at Bowie State, and here at MICA, I still have them, you know, and those relationships still have impact upon my life today. So I think most importantly, like, no matter where you are, like the opportunity to be surrounded by people, like-minded people, in whatever space that you're in, will always be um, important and something that you'll be able to access in whatever space that you're in. But, they'll, but these people that you're building with and that you're spending time with will always um, have impact on your life moving forward. I just want to thank all of you for coming today. I'd like to thank these incredible panelists. 
these incredible artists and entrepreneurs, designers who are really changing the world, making the culture of our time. That is what we say that a MICA education is going to provide the cultural producers of our time, and here they are in front of you. Um, thank you so much. So many great um, events and opportunities throughout the day. Please avail yourself of all of them, and thank you for coming. Thank our panel one more time. <laughs>